Hi everyone, my name is Nicole, and today I'm going to be speaking about the discrimination of certain dog breeds in America. But first I just want to start with a short little game that I call Find the Bull. Um, behind me there are 11 pictures of very adorable dogs, and for the next like 10 seconds I, just, I want you guys to just take a look at all the dogs on the board, and if you could, the first dog that, the first picture you see that screams pit bull to you, write down the number or keep it in your head, and then I'll ask for a couple of volunteers. <coughs> And then you go, well, I want to see which one you think is the pit bull. There's only one pit bull up here. All the other ones are real dog breeds. So I'll give you guys a few <coughs> seconds, take a look at them, and then we'll answer. We'll do a little question and answer. So go. <laughs> Everybody has, have a general idea of which number they think is a pit? Yes, no, Sir. yes? Yeah. Okay. All right, so raise your hands, let's see. Yes? Number seven. No, that is a cane corso, and yes, they're all real dog breeds, yeah. Eleven? Nope, that's a Roddy. Two? Nope, that's a blue-blooded bulldog, yes. Five? Nope, that's a Thai Ridgeback, oh. yeah. Four? Nope, that's a Presa Canaria, one more. One? Nope, that is a Dog de Bordeaux. It's a French Mastiff. Okay, no more, because we'll eventually just end up picking them all. <laughs> the real pit bull is number three. Oh, oh, Believe it or not, this, this is the pit. The rest of them are all different types of dog breeds. They all look pretty similar, but number three is the actual American Pit Bull Terrier. Um, and these were actually the results I was expecting, so don't be disappointed in yourselves that you don't we're not season Milan. <laughs> um, what I just demonstrated is called breed misidentification. For many people, a pit bull is a big-headed dog with cropped ears, like number four here, or a big stocky dog with muscular body, like number two. He looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's on like steroids, or even a dog with a brindle <laughs> coat, like number nine, our Great Dane. That is a Great Dane. Um, but this exercise just showed that the general public, meaning all of you for today are often misinformed about what a pit bull really looks like and what he really is. I mean, number three doesn't look anything like number four. He's tiny. He's got a pretty proportionate sized body. Most people don't see, when they look at that, they don't see a pit bull. So, because you're uninformed about what a pit bull really is, you end up discriminating against dogs that you've been told look like a pit bull, like this one and that one. Discrimination against dogs of certain breeds based on incidents of publicized canine aggression is morally unacceptable. This knowledge of discrimination is important for everyone to understand, especially dog owners, regardless of what type of dog breed you own, be it a Yorkie or a Maltese or something easily recognizable like a Golden Retriever, doesn't matter. It's, it's important to know what a, what, what a certain type of dog looks like, even if you're a cat person. It's still important to know if you live in a society. Um, today I'm going to be focusing on three main issues that shape the public's discriminatory view on certain dog breeds. Breed discrimination has been actively present in American society for over 150 years. Breed discrimination is influenced by the media's lack of details or incorrect or even biased information. And finally, breed discrimination forces the public to judge a certain dog breed based on the actions and or appearance of one dog. But let's begin by examining my first point, which is the presence of breed discrimination in American history. Like I said, breed discrimination has been present in American history for over 150 years. Essentially, as long as there's been people living in a society together, there have been dogs living with the people in their society. There have always been people, be it just the general public or the media, that influence the way a dog is seen. There have been many dog breeds throughout the years that were made to bear the brunt of this hatred and misunderstanding of the public. <coughs> Um, some breeds like dog hounds, Doberman pincers, German shepherds, and now pit bulls have been the target of public mistrust and um, even slander by the media due to often misconstrued and even ridiculous ideas of what they're capable of, what they're not capable of, and what their jobs are. Uh, for example, in the 1800s, bloodhounds were a popular tool used by the police officers and other law enforcement to track either a runaway slave, runaway criminal, someone of interest that they were looking for. Now, bloodhounds, they're warm-blooded animals, but they're very, they have a very keen sense of smell. And they can track any warm-blooded animal, horse, deer, human, rabbit, something like that. The media in the 1800s often portrayed Dober, um, excuse me, bloodhounds as bloodthirsty hunters that followed a blood trail because they due to the, their lust for blood. They wanted to bite and kill and taste the blood, which is completely not true. 
although dogs are carnivorous, they weren't trained to be um, intimidation tools. They were just simply to help the police officers find their suspect. Another example is uh, the Doberman Pinschers. They were very popular in this country before World War II. But after World War II, um, their, their status in this country dropped su substantially. The Nazis used the Dobies um, as an intimidation tool to get answers out of um, prisoners and also as a killing tool. They would, <coughs> kill the dogs, uh, they would train the dogs to kill, kind of like people do with pit bulls in this country. Um, after the war, Dobermans were seen in this, uh, in this country as, with some interesting names, such as crazed killers, Nazi hounds, and homicidal muscle hounds, which is probably one of my favorites. <laughs> they were often said to be stupid as well, because of the size of their head. They have very narrow heads, and the idea behind this was the smaller the skull, the smaller the brain, and therefore the dog must be an idiot, which is completely untrue because they're one of the very most intelligent dog breeds. They actually helped find survivors of the World Trade Center attacks. They're pretty smart. <coughs> Another direct um, relationship between racial discrimination of humans and breed discrimination of dogs is the German Shepherds. After World War II, any dog with the word German in its name was considered, you know, just as low as dirt because everyone was against Germans at that time. So not only was it racial discrimination against humans, it was racial discrimination against dogs. And now on to today's society. Um, pit bulls have a lot of uh, negative aspects associated with, associated with them. One of the claims that the media has made recently is that pit bulls have locking jaws, so when it, once it bites onto something, be it, a, be it a chew toy, or your couch, or someone's leg, or another dog, it locks its jaws and won't let go until the dog decides to let go. Another claim is that pit bulls have the ability to exert over 2,600 psi in a single bite. Both of these claims are completely ridiculous. There's no way that a, any canine, Yorkie to Great Dane, can lock its jaws. It's just not possible. As well, and on average, a dog can only exert about 200 to 400 psi in a single bite, not 2,600 psi. You see the difference in the numbers. It's just ridiculous. Now, I'd like to examine the negative influence that the media has on potentially violent dog breeds. Breed discrimination is influenced by the media, and it's incorrect, biased, or even absence of information. Karen Delise, the author of The Pitbull Placebo and a Licensed Veterinary Technician, explains in her book that, quote, since no dog breed is inherently vicious, the creation of a vicious breed is in reality the creation of an image. And what she's saying is basically, there's no dog that is born to kill. They're trained to kill, but there's no dog breed that's born and said, just wants to kill everything it sees. They are carnivorous, but that's just not in their, in their genes. Lions, yes. Dogs, not, not really. Um, so essentially, the, media's, the media creates that image of the dog, and then it has to carry that for as long as the breed survives. In both her book and on her website, which is the <coughs> National Canine Research Council, Delise explains how oftentimes the actual events that lead up to a dog attack or a dog bite incident um, is often misunderstood by the police and the reporters, so the person reporting the incident, the police don't get the right information. And then when the media gets the information from the police, they don't get the right information. It's like the game of telephone. When you start with one person, by the time it gets back, the message gets back to you, it's completely distorted. Um, more often than not, the breed or description of the criminal dog, the dog that did the biting, is either elaborated or even changed to bolster the story's popularity with the, with the general public. So to make the story more interesting, they'll change the breed of the dog just to get people to read it more. Which is a little twisted, because they're like pointing fingers. Um, finally, I'd like to look at the actions of one dog and its, the, effect, the effect it has on the breed as a whole. Breed discrimination forces the public to judge a certain breed of dog based on the actions or appearances of one dog. I'm sure we've all been in the scenario where we're sitting in a classroom and one kid in the class is being a real brat. <laughs> they're like texting on their phone, they're being, you know, they're just the only problem in the classroom, but they're misbehaving. And the teacher, in order to get them to stop, will punish the entire class. They'll give everybody extra homework, they'll keep someone after class, they'll keep the entire class late. This idea of punishing the masses for the actions of the few is the best way to understand this aspect of breed discrimination. Um, by negatively or over-exaggerating or even describe, you know, over-exaggerating 
an incident involving a dog attack or a dog bite. Um, it, the description of the dog involved and even the breed of the dog is affected neg negatively. It's looked at as, you know, a very bad dog to be around. This point relates back to my second point with the media and its influence, because it's even more dangerous when a dog is described inaccurately. So if a German Shepherd was to bite someone, and the police officer didn't write down that it was a German Shepherd, and, the, and then the media puts in, well, you can't have a sentence, you know, a woman was bit by a dog, you want to make it interesting. So you put Pitbull in there, or you put Cane Corso in there. And then everyone who sees one of those dogs on the street is like, oh my goodness, it's a pit bull, you know, stay away from me. And therefore the entire breed suffers due to the one incident involving one dog. And now it's quite obvious that we live in a society where discrimination is a powerful force and it affects our dogs as well as us. As you will recall, I explained that breed discrimination has been part of American history for over 150 years. It's influenced by the media and it's false or biased information. And it forces the general public to judge certain dog breeds based on one incident involving one dog, whether it's true or not. It's important for everyone to be educated in this issue, whether you own a dog or not. Like I said, if you don't own a dog, it's so important for you to know about this. So you can help to educate your family and friends and stop the spread of, or even lessen the spread of breed discrimination. And thank you for your time.